Good morning again, everybody, and welcome back to the uh, second session of our Peel uh, 2021 conference. Uh, this is our COVID-19 panel. Um, to begin with, just very briefly, uh, I'm going to introduce our moderator, Sahil Kerr, who is a solicitor at the Good Law Project, uh, where he works across the whole range of uh, public interest litigation that the Good Law Project covers, um, but primarily on environmental issues and projects. Uh, Sahil Kerr has been particularly involved in the recent litigation around the government's airport's national policy statement um, around the expansion of Heathrow and other airports uh, and is currently working on a, a plan to take the UK government to court over air quality and uh, air pollution targets. He was formerly a, an associate at Herbert Smith Freehills um, and, and now is, as I said, for those that are just joining, because I see we're gradually filling up with attendees, now a solicitor at the Good Law Project. Um, just a very quick bit of housekeeping before I hand over to Sahil for the rest of the, of the panel. If you want to ask a question, and please do ask lots of questions throughout, um, if you could just pop that in the Q&A, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, at the end of the presentations, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but um, don't use the chat, use the Q&A. Um, that would be great. And now without uh, more ado, I'm going to be quiet and I'm gonna hand over to Sahil Kerr. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Lewis, and, and welcome everyone to the COVID panel of, of the conference, uh, where we'll be looking at um, how environmental concerns um, intersect with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as Lois said, I'm going to say this again, I'm a solicitor at Good Law Project, um, and I find myself um, in, in the fortunate position of being able to sit back and let four very experienced professionals do the heavy lifting. Um, so my job's really easy today, uh, but I'm really excited to hear from, hear from all of them. Um, and too often it, it seems to me that, that, that particularly on topics around the environment, we seem to operate slightly in silos. The, the sort of lawyers sometimes don't speak to the academics. Um, and, and so it's great to have a range of perspectives in, in, in one session. Um, and I'll do sort of longer introductions in due course, but just, just for background, we're joined today by Chris Murray from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine um, and from and Imperial College, um, Anna Heslop from the pioneering NGO Klein Earth, um, Yasser Vanderman uh, from Landmark Chambers, who's, who's a good friend of the Good Law Project, um, and Monica Ferriatenta from 20 Essex Chambers, uh, who's a leading public international lawyer. Um, and as I said, I'll, I'll introduce everyone um, as, as they come up to speak. Um, uh, so just a little bit about myself. Um, you may know Good Law Project from uh, some greatest hits, such as, such as the recent list of procurement challenges um, that, that we've brought over the last year or so. Uh, but but over the, we're still a very young organization, but we also have a developing environmental practice. Um, and we've had some success recently in getting uh, the government uh, to commit to reviewing its energy national policy statements, uh, which we argued were out of date given the UK's climate change commitments. And as Lois said, we are currently running a similar claim in relation to the airport MPS which is a part of a suite of litigation that concerns uh, Heathrow Airport that a lot of NGOs have, have brought over over the last uh, many years. Um, and in addition, we worked on uh, the clean air case that, that Yasser is going to talk to you about um, and, and are doing some thinking around how we, how we clean our waterways in the UK. Um, and, and our approach to climate, cha uh, and, uh, climate change litigation is, is, is slightly lopsided in that we don't have the research chops or, and the years of ex experience a lot of other NGOs have uh, but we have a risk appetite um, that allows us to approach things in a slightly different way. And, and we, we essentially want to use the power of litigation as, as a, to move the political dial. And, and we always ask ourselves the question, is this moving the political dial forward? And, and will it increase the political costs um, associated if, if the government was to break its promises to the future generations? Um, and in that respect, we see success slightly differently. Um, but you know we're a young organisation and, and we're learning as we go along. And I'm 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 really looking forward to hearing from four very very experienced practitioners. Um, just moving on to the the theme of today's session. Um, so COVID nineteen, to my mind, um, has slightly displaced climate change in, in terms of uh, 
the topic of discussion hot on everyone's agendas over the last year. But but it seems to me that there is a link between the two, and and there is a and and there's a, there's a wider link between climate change and, and health that that's very well documented. Um, and as always with all of these things, uh, it is vulnerable communities, the natural environment um, that is the most impacted by both climate change and, and COVID nineteen. Um, and as we scramble out of it, we're, we're seeing the same with COVID nineteen again, as vulnerable communities are are left behind in, a, in, in the vaccine race, just as they are more likely to suffer from the impact of climate change. Um, and, and to me, it seems that aligning responses uh, to both these crises is, is crucial. Uh, it, it seems to me that we need to develop, the, co the call, call of the hour is to develop a global solution uh, and a sustainable one that protects the natural environment, wildlife, habitats, and communities. Um, so without further ado, I'm, I'm now going to hand over to Chris, who's our first speaker, um, and, and Chris is, is the Associate Professor of Environmental Change and Health at the MRC unit the Gambia at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and a Senior Lecturer at, uh, in the School of Public Health at the Imperial College London. And Chris's background is in ecology, um, and he's worked on projects in the human-animal environment nexus, uh, which is a particularly, obviously, relevant topic now, uh, particularly on the role of global environmental change in shaping impacts on biodiversity and health. Um, with, that, with that background, um, I'm going to hand over to you now, Chris. Okay, thank you a lot, Sahil. Um, I'm going to try sharing my screen here, and I'm just going to um put in the caveat that i'm coming from uh i'm based in the gambia and our internet is notoriously unstable so i do apologize in advance if i freeze or you know get lost in the ether or whatever i'll just try to call back in uh if that happens um let me try and pull these slides up um okay is that coming through on your end yeah that's great chris all right, good. And I'll just minimize all these faces so I can actually see what I'm uh, supposed to be talking about. Um, yeah, so thanks for the introduction, uh, Sahil. I think you covered all the main bases that give the sort of context for where I'm coming from with respect to this, um, you know, this issue of COVID and the emergence of new diseases and, and, and pandemics and, and, and this kind of nexus position between you know these global change processes like climate and land use that you sort of mentioned the role of biodiversity and ecosystems in providing pathogens to humans and then the, the process of how they move from uh you know from one species to another including into to humans um so i'm going to give a pretty sort of um general scientific overview on this um sure, okay here we go um you know, I don't want to sort of get bogged down in the in the nitty gritty of the science, um, which is actually what I'm used to talking about. So again, forgive me if I kind of get a little bit technical at times, but uh, I'm going to try and keep this pretty, pretty light. Um, so the first thing I want to sort of put across there is that that even though we're dealing with a global health emergency right now, um, you know, from my perspective and from the perspective of the stats that we have on the health of the global population, we're, we're really living in an unprecedent, unprecedentedly successful time. Like health metrics have never really looked as good as they do now. That's across the board of, of many, many different contributors to the burden of disease. There are, of course, some things that are, but most things, we're sort of getting under control. People are living for longer. Things that used to knock people off are being displaced by things that are sort of preserving, um, you know, the length of people's lives and uh, the quality of people's lives. And that's pretty much universal, in, except in cases where you have complete societal breakdown, which you can see some of the lines in the inset graph here. That's a that's a graph of life expectancy for all the countries on Earth, and you can kind of see that, you know, broadly speaking countries are living, you know, people in different countries are living longer. Um, and set, set against that is this sort of issue of the global burden of disease. That's a term that describes the total contribution of all of the things that kill us or maim us or make our, our lives miserable. There are these like accounts of, of um, you know, those, those risk factors and the, out, and, and the health endpoints. And we can broadly see what's going up, what's going down. So this figure here with the blue, red and the green, that's showing, 
the total burden of disease split up by the major categories. In blue, we have non-communicable diseases, and you can see that the share of non-communicable diseases is increasing. Um, and that's because it's, displaced, it's, it's displacing the previous share of, of what is here in red, the other category, and this includes infectious diseases. So the take home message here is that infectious diseases at a global level are, are being you know, controlled in such a way that the, their total contribution to ill health is, is going down through time. So I think that's a really important sort of contextual baseline here. But as I mentioned, not everything is going in the right direction. And there's this category of, of diseases that we call emerging infectious diseases that are sort of bucking this trend. And this is a, a, some, some data from a paper from a few years ago, just sort of showing what that looks like for four example diseases. Here we have plague, rabies, Lyme disease, and hantavirus. And all of these diseases are showing signs of increasing their global um, incidence or their impact or uh, their prevalence. Um, and this is a story that sort of emerged probably primarily over the last sort of 20 years is that this category of diseases that we call emerging infectious diseases seem to be increasing through time. So this plot on the right hand side by Kate Jones and colleagues shows this kind of growth in the reporting of these emerging infectious diseases. And of course, all of the major diseases that have you know, affected humans, some of the ones that I've listed on the left there, plague, Spanish flu, HIV, SARS, MERS, avian influenza, Zika, Ebola, these are all at some point considered emerging infectious diseases, and then they go on to become pandemics. So it's, it's fair to say that all pandemics are emerging infectious diseases, but in fact, not all emerging infectious diseases become pandemics. And that's an important point that I'm going to come back to in a sec. Another thing we need to know about emerging infectious diseases, it, apart from the fact that they're increasing through time or apparently increasing through time, is that most of them uh, come from animals. Most of them come from animal reservoirs. And we call these diseases zoonotic diseases. These are diseases that have moved from a, a vertebrate host into the human population by some, you know, either directly or by some sort of bridging vector. Um, so it could be an intermediate host or, or an insect vector. Um, so this is a really, really important group of diseases, what we call zoonotic diseases in this story of, of, of emergence. Um, and of those animal diseases around about, um, I mean, of the, the total number of emerging infectious diseases, around about half come from wildlife specifically. So most of the animal origin diseases are actually coming from, from wildlife ultimately the origin is from from wildlife and this of course has been the 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 story behind some of these big big um you know popular science um outputs you know this book by david Quammen on spillover and you know movies like contagion and outbreak and that kind of thing that i'm sure that many of you have have seen and that brings us up to the sort of present point where we're kind of dealing now with the most with the latest of the most impactful emerging infectious diseases one of the most impactful we've seen in a long time um, this is COVID, of course, um, and this is caused by a coronavirus. I'm sure everybody is pretty familiar with this story by now. And this family of coronaviruses that is that 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 sort of gives us this this new what we call SARS coronavirus two um, is associated with uh, horseshoe bats. These sort of small um, bats. There's you know lots and lots of species of these bats around the world, and these this family of coronaviruses. Um, is associated with these bats. So this is the bare, the bare bones of zoonotic disease emergence. This figure shows the sort of process or a conceptual model about how these things start to move around in landscapes and how they might come to, to trickle over into human population. Here we have the biggest circle is sort of what, we're, what we call the biosphere. Within that biosphere, we have a domestic landscape within which we live together with our livestock um, and then there's some kind of mixing between wildlife in that biosphere, livestock, and then direct contact with humans. And some examples that I've kind of already mentioned here, direct transmission from wildlife to humans includes HIV, Ebola, rabies, um, SARS. Uh, and then there's some diseases that are more associated with the disturbance of the environment, things like yellow fever, Lyme disease, and hantavirus. And then there are other diseases that also involve this livestock step. So we have, you know, for example, Nipah virus, spilling over from bats into pigs before they move into, into people. 
this is the most important figure for today's discussion, I think. This is the, the sort of a conceptual diagram of the process of spillover. Spillover is a specific type of disease emergence. Um, it's really the initial step for how that pathogen goes from some other, other species and moves into, you know, actually can be another wildlife species or it can be into the human population. And there's three really important pillars of this process of spillover. One of them is the prevalence of a particular pathogen in a reservoir, a wildlife reservoir species or a livestock reservoir species. The second important pillar here is the contact rate between those reservoir animals and humans. And then the third important pillar is how likely is it that that pathogen can then transmit to people given that, that there's been some contact event. And all of these sort of like uh, bullet points within these three categories are all of the sort of ingredients or the levers that you need for these things to, to, to happen and to, 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 to potentially change the risk of zoonotic spillover. So an example of the, that's most commonly cited with respect to for example, the environmental impact on pandemic emergence is the way that, that our impacts on the environment catalyze opportunities to, to meet wildlife species, you know, through the increase of people in the landscape, for example, that could increase the, the contact rate and that could increase the overall spillover risk. Now, importantly, that's just the first step, as I mentioned, of this spillover of, of this of this process of going from uh, from a, a pathogen that's living happily in a wildlife animal in the environment somewhere, spilling over into the human population. And then it can, there's this other process that needs to happen for this to become a pandemic. First, you need to be able to have a human to human transmission component. And for that human to human transmission component to then spread to a considerable number of countries around the world. You know, for example, through the increase in airline travel that we're all very uh, familiar with. And it's really fair to say that the process of spillover is probably fairly common. It's probably happening all the time. Um, probably mostly it goes undetected because you have spillover events that don't ever get to that point of having successful human to human transmission. Most of those cases will probably be aborted and never even be, be seen. And then it's much less common for that process to then trigger, uh, you know, this, this additional step of, of going into the sort of pandemic sort of phase. So in order to sort of break down the complexity of this a little bit, just want you to consider how, um, how crazy this sort of biodiversity interface really is. This is a catalog of all of the pathogens that we know about uh, in, in humans. So we have like a couple, you know, few hundred viruses, a thousand bacteria, 500 fungi, and the rest of it. There's, a lot, there's, there's lots and lots of things that are trying to sort of parasitize us and can potentially infect us. Um, and on the graph on the right, what this is showing is that almost all of the diseases that are coming from vectors or, or animal species actually have multiple hosts or multiple vectors involved in their epidemiology. It's very rarely just a single animal or a single vector. Um, and in addition to that, we have this, this, this sort of general pool of unknown pathogenic or pathogen diversity that, that exists in wildlife. So we know a few of these pathogens in comparison to what is really out there in terms of the what's being hosted by, by wild species. We call this sometimes the pathogen pool. You can kind of think about it as like, you know, fishing in a pond um, filled with pathogens and, you know, you, don't, you never really know what's going to come out. Um, and the estimates at the moment, the best estimates that I've seen suggest that there could be around 10,000 unknown zoonotic viruses, not just, this is not including bacteria and fungi, um, that exist in, in, in mammals that have some kind of potential to spill over into people. So the story is that most human infectious diseases are zoonotic. If they are zoonotic, then they're usually multiple hosts. If they're zoonotic, around about half of them also have disease vectors. So they're, they're, they're arthropods that can move these things between species. And if they're vector-borne, then usually there's multiple vectors. And then if they're vector-borne, most of the vector-borne diseases also have animal reservoir hosts. So they're also zoonotic. And then finally, most of the pathogens in the world we don't know about. So it's an incredibly complex landscape to try to pick apart the process of, of, of disease emergence. A very high level sort of... Um, kind of a bird's eye view of what we're doing to the planet. Um, you know, some of this stuff has already been mentioned previously, but we're, you know, really having massive impacts on the planet. We've modified 50% of the Earth's ice-free ice land surface. We've raised sea levels, we've acidified the oceans, we've increased the rate of extinction by 
probably three or four orders of magnitude relative to the um, to the historical sort of average. We've changed the climate already past one degree compared to the industrial, uh, the age of the industrial revolution. There's been a threefold increase in global population since 1950 and a 56 fold increase in international travel since 1950. So all of these things are just having absolutely unbelievable impacts on the natural environment. And the, you know, the, the, the issue here is that we, you know, we're trying to grapple with what all of these impacts are really doing to the ecology of, uh, of diseases in, in, in the environment, but also the relationship between those diseases uh, getting into the human population. So here's another sort of curious thing is that despite the fact that there's this huge reservoir of species giving us pathogens, so you would think that the total risk of receiving a pathogen is sort of proportional to the total biodiversity that's out there, that at a large scale is probably true. The curious thing is that sometimes when we remove that biodiversity, that also increases the risk of, um, of spillover. Um, and it's a little bit counter, counterintuitive as to why that might be. Uh, you'd think that if you remove all the zoonotic hosts, then you re reduce the risk of a zoonotic spillover. That's probably true in a large number of cases. But in some cases, what that removal of biodiversity does is disrupt the disease dynamics in the wildlife um, hosts. The process of people moving into landscapes and, and, and tromping on habitats and that kind of thing can um, change the contact rate between the species that are left there and, 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 and ourselves. So that can increase the risk of of, of spillover and then in some cases it can it can you know be some other pathway related to that to that three pillar um, kind of ingredients or the levers for, for spillover that I mentioned earlier. The point is here is that is that the land use change and the impacts that we're having on the environment and this could equally apply to to climate and climate change impacts is changing the natural dynamics of, of disease. In some cases that's increasing risk um, and the question is well, is it increasing risk more than it's than it's decreasing risk? Some people think that it, it, that it is, that we're in the, this age of pandemics where we've never had a risky environment. Um, I think the evidence for that is still a little bit, uh, you know, is, is still out. Um, that's, that's some of the stuff that I'm working on academically and I'd be happy to take some questions on, on afterwards, perhaps. Um, and then just some final kind of where this fits into the, the broader scheme of things. Some of you may have heard of this concept of the planetary boundaries, which is this, this idea that we've got these systems in the planetary system that, 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 that together sort of define what we call the safe operating space for humanity. So we've got the climate system, we've got atmosphere, we've got the, the chemical flows in the environment, we've got water, we've got land system change and then biosphere integrity. Um, and I'd sort of put it to you that while most of these things are interconnected and they're all important, the majority of the action with respect to disease emergence is really in this sort of top left quadrant that includes climate, the, the integrity of the, of the biosphere and, and land system change. And so this is really where we're spending most of our attention with respect to disease emergence at present. So coming back to um, coronavirus, um, we think it's a very likely a wildlife origin disease. Um, as I mentioned before, it's associated with horseshoe bats. And there has, of course, been a lot of talk about this association with the wet market in Wuhan, um, where some of the, you know, the original cluster of infections was detected. Um, I would say at the moment, we are not really anywhere close to knowing how our impacts on the environment have contributed to the emergence of um, of COVID. Most of what we know about the emergence of this, of this disease is really speculative. It's, we've got some circumstantial evidence with the wet market, some information about the species that were there and the prevalence of, 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 of different types of coronaviruses and things in, 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 in the market and in the broader area and, and, and people, of course. But this is really under investigation and one of the big mysteries of, um, you know, of, this, of this pandemic. There's been a WHO team working there uh, and the conclusion really is, you know, we don't really know. So a lot of every, a lot of the stuff that we've seen about deforestation, agricultural intensification and things, they are definitely important for disease emergence, but we don't know what their role has been for COVID specifically. So I just kind of put it, put it there as a, as a, as a sort of a, um, a point to the evidence about how this, this evidence sort of feeds into things like policy and, 
and you know in in this in this um, panel presumably law and 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 um, you know everything related to how we're going to try to control the future emergence of these types of diseases. So I'll leave it there and um, yeah thanks again for for inviting me and happy to take questions after the other um, speakers. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Chris. That was a lot of insight. I found that really fascinating. Um, yeah, uh, shows how, so shows how much of the uh, the gap between the actual science and the science that is reported, and and, and it's nice it's nice to get full picture. Um, so moving on now, um, our, our next speaker is is Anna Heswap, um, who's um, a lawyer who's who's worked in who's worked in private practice at the European Commission and in a number of environmental NGOs. So it's a really wide ranging experience. Um, uh, Anna joined, the, as I said, the NGO Client Earth in 2015 and has since worked on clean air litigation and biomass issues uh, before heading up the Wildlife and Habitats program. And, and Anna's team delivers a strategy addressing wildlife issues around the world, um, conserving forests in Central and Eastern Europe and, and protecting animals and defending uh, Natura 2000 sites. Um, and her team also works at a global level um, on the convention and bi biological diversity. So it's so a really interesting perspective. And um, Anna, over to you. Thank you very much, Sahil. Um, and good morning, uh, everybody. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Oops, it says. Um, I've got some slides here to share with you. Oops. There we go. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about how we use the law to protect habitats. Um, and uh, it's quite interesting to hear Sahil's introduction and talking about the climate crisis and talking about the kind of COVID crisis. For me, there's another crisis going on, which is the biodiversity crisis. Um, and we're really seeing uh, COVID as a kind of a symptom of that crisis, really. It's, a, it's, it's as, as um, Chris was saying, there is a sort of an emerging link between habitat loss um, and, and sort of people encroaching on, on uh, the, the habitats of wildlife um, and uh, the sort of increase in, in potential for sort of zoonotic uh, disease um, transmission. And that's really one of the symptoms of the kind of crisis that we're seeing internationally in terms of biodiversity loss. So we've had a couple of really important um, uh, scientific papers been published in the last couple of years, sort of chronicling how bad that loss is. And really, we see it as a kind of twin crisis with climate change. If we fix climate change and we don't fix the biodiversity crisis, we're all going to be screwed. So um, <laughs> we really have to look at both of them. So we've got 1 million species of plants and animals that are at risk of extinction. We've lost 32 million hectares of primary and recovering forest over the course of five years. Um, we've lost huge amounts of coral reefs. Why that matters is, is you know, partly because of this increased interaction with, um, with wildlife and with, with uh, you know species that perhaps we wouldn't have been interacting with as much before but also you know nature is kind of essential for our existence we sort of don't think about we think oh look we love seeing a lovely tree or a lovely field or a lovely forest but actually if those things were gone we would struggle to survive as a species um you know we, we rely on pollinators we rely on um terrestrial ecosystems and that also has an impact for climate change um in terms of sequestering carbon and um, yeah making sure we don't have floods and and those sorts of things. The things that are causing this crisis are um, really a huge amount of it is around, is around changes in land use and that that's also sort of one of the things that's driving this increased kind of exposure to to wildlife bet between humans and increased interactions between humans and wildlife and therefore potential exposure to, to zoonotic diseases and um, so we see deforestation we see um, you know uh, areas being encroached upon to plant palm oil or to um, you know graze cattle that previously would have been sort of wilder areas. There's a whole bunch of other things that are causing the biodiversity crisis. Harmful economic incentives tend to drive those sorts of um, trades uh, and there are outside pressures on areas that previously would have been managed uh, at a sort of much smaller scale by local communities and indigenous people. And that's where we see some of this sort of push to reach further into the forest for food or to, to reach further into the forest for um, land. 
that causes some of these interactions. We can fix it. So the good news from these reports over the last couple of years, as terrifying as they are to read, is that, that, that we can take action to mitigate and remedy some of this stuff. And from my point of view, the most interesting bit of that is that we can do some of that through environmental justice. So by, by giving people greater access to um, uh, environmental justice, by making sure that we're holding decision makers and companies to account, we can actually start to um, reverse some of these trends and make sure that we are protecting biodiversity. And that's really the kind of role of my team and, and people like us. So at Client Earth, we kind of, we have sort of a three level approach to, to making sure we get more environmental justice. So the first is get the right laws in place. The second is to get them properly implemented, so make sure governments are actually doing them rather than just writing the right thing down. And then if they fail to do that, taking legal action. So we don't sort of start with litigation, but we, we kind of go through all of those stages of the, the sort of legal process of, of kind of right the way from, you know, advocating for good laws in the first place through to suing people when they don't do them properly. <laughs> um, and in terms of wildlife and habitats laws, there are sort of various different levels at which that can happen. So um, we do quite a lot, uh, particularly in the EU, around protected areas. So there is this fantastic piece of EU law called the, the um, Habitats Directive, the Birds and Habitats Directives. They are transposed into UK law, so you do have an equivalent in the UK. Um, and those require protection of specific areas. So in the UK, those are, um, are often sites of special scientific interest, although the UK has some sites that, that were not previously European sites that are additional as well. Um, and, and on those sites, there's, there's a sort of regulation of the types of activities that can occur and a sort of protection as to as to how many damaging activities can happen in those sites and whether sort of compensation has to happen if you're going to do something um, bad there. It's, it's a very strong piece of law and it's something that we use very widely across the EU. Um, and it's been a very successful law. It's been around since uh, the early 90s. The Birds Directive has been around since the since the 70s. And, and it's, it's proved to be one of the strongest pieces of environmental uh, legislation. And actually, we use it not only to protect habitats, but sometimes we'll use those tools to get a kind of dual win where we're stopping a coal fired power station by using a habitats directive argument, or we're you know, trying to stop pesticides from being used by using a, a habitats directive argument. So they can have sort of dual benefits for, for public health as well as, or for climate change, as well as for um, habitats and species. There's also a requirement to protect species. So certain species are protected regardless of whether they are inside a protected site or outside because some of them like to wander around. Um, uh, and of course, drawing lines on maps and saying we're going to regulate what happens here is, is quite simple with a, a species that doesn't move a lot, like a plant. But it's very difficult with something like, uh, you know, something that, that moves around or is perhaps more widespread. There's also uh, an issue about kind of restoring wider ecosystems. So as I said earlier, we've, we've had huge amounts of sort of habitat loss and there's a really big need to restore some of those ecosystems and not just inside protected areas and saying, OK, the, these are the kind of jewels and everything else can be trashed. That doesn't work because you need to have connectivity between different sites in order for that ecosystem to kind of function uh, well. So there's a, a real need to kind of do some restoration and it's something that we're pushing for in the UK as part of the Environment Bill and we're also pushing for that at EU level. Um, uh, uh, the EU has proposed a new restoration law which we are hoping will, will come into being in the next year or so. But it's also about more than just wildlife laws. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the cases that Client Earth has brought to protect the environment that may be kind of novel ways of using the law that we might not think about. So uh, there is there's certainly sort of stuff around trade and investment law that we really sort of start to think about actually how do we change the whole mindset of a sort of industry here and how do we make sure that there are kind of safeguards in place so that if you are importing timber 
from uh, a country that has a really massively diverse diverse rainforest how do you put limits on the, what's allowed to be imported into your uh, sort of country to make sure that, that that's not causing huge environmental damage or how do we sort of regulate the import of palm oil or soy or something like that to make sure it's not causing environmental damage and you can put these sort of due diligence regulations in place to make sure that 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 isn't happening. There's a huge push at the moment happening with a, a sort of due diligence package. Again, I'm talking about the EU and I'm sorry, I realize a lot of you are, are based in the UK, but um, we often see the, the two kind of reflecting each other. We're hoping to create a race to the top rather than a race to the bottom between the UK and the EU. So hopefully these things will, will stay in place. There's also, uh, you know, using human rights laws can sometimes be very useful in terms of protecting biodiversity. So we have a case that we're working on in the Torres Straits, um, which is uh, which are uh, some, some islands um, near Australia, um, where indigenous people, um, their, their um, islands are being basically eroded by sea level rise caused by climate change. Um, and so their indigenous historical way of life is also being threatened. Um, there's also a huge threat to the biodiversity on those islands because the islands are disappearing and there's a coral reef which is being damaged and so on. And so we have um, worked with those local islanders to help them to bring a complaint um, uh, to a, a UN body to uh, a, about human rights um, to sort of say that their rights as Indigenous people are being um, eroded by the fact that, that the Australian government keeps making climate policy which is uh, extremely unhelpful and um, you know allowing coal mines to go ahead and so on and not taking into account the, the issues about their human rights. We also do quite a lot of work with um, uh, local communities in West Africa so trying to help communities to not just uh, kind of protect the land and put a fence around it but helping them to manage their land so, so often local communities if they are invested in managing the forests around where they live, have a much, much better um, rate of success at, at protecting those forests and the species that live in them than if you uh, allow a sort of big logging company to come in and cut the whole lot down and do it in a much more um, sort of... Uh, nasty way. So giving communities forestry rights and making sure that they know what their rights are and that, and that the law is, is kind of empowering them to use the law is really, really important. And we have a whole team that do that in, um, in West Africa. And it's, uh, yeah, it's really useful to, to help, help local and indigenous communities to use those, those laws. There's also a little bit around uh, finance law. So one of the things that we do at Client Earth is we've tried to, we, this has mostly so far been in climate change, but we're now sort of looking at biodiversity. In the past, NGOs would always argue for a company that they, they should do the right thing because it's their responsibility to do the right thing. Um, you know, big company, you're doing something bad for the environment and you should stop because you have a responsibility. And we've actually sort of tried to flip that round and say to the companies, if you don't do the right thing, you have a liability. So it is in your interest to do the right thing from a business point of view, not just from a moral point of view. And this kind of um, found its way uh, into the courts in Poland. So there was a, there was a big uh, coal-fired power station in Poland which wanted to expand. It was gonna be given a huge kind of subsidy by the Polish government in the first years of its expansion, but that would have to phase out because of climate change rules. Um, and so we uh, said to the company, this isn't a good investment, you shouldn't be building this. Um, and they said, no, 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 we want to go ahead with it anyway. So we bought some shares in the company. We advised them as a shareholder that we didn't think it was a good investment. Um, and we gave them lots of evidence about why that was going to be a bad investment and why it would be bad use of uh, the company's money. Um, and they went ahead and made the decision anyway. So we took them to court in Poland and as shareholders, we brought a case saying it's you are you, the company are taking a, a decision which is not in my interest as a shareholder. Um, and we won that case and that coal fire power station is no longer going to expand. Um, so using those sort of different laws to try to protect the environment 
um, can be quite powerful. We're also uh, using energy laws in some places. So outside of the EU, um, uh, on the sort of borders of the EU, there are a number of countries who are um, signed up to what's called the Energy Community Treaty. Um, they are largely states that want to join the EU in due course. And so they start to kind of become part of the EU's energy market and, um, and, and follow some of its rules. And through that treaty, we are able to hold uh, some of those countries to account when they make poor decisions about building new coal-fired power stations or putting hydroelectric dams onto um, pristine rivers and so on. So we can kind of use those laws, uh, those sort of energy regulations and the EIA directive, which comes through that energy law um, to protect uh, those places. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to mention briefly is the Convention on Biological Diversity. So the Convention on Biological Diversity has been around for a long time and it hasn't always been terribly effective, <laughs> but it's due for a uh, conference of the parties. It was actually due in October last year. It's been delayed now to October this year, if we manage to get there with um, COVID restrictions in place. Um, but that is a, a process where there's a plan to kind of set targets at international level for the protection of biodiversity. Now we had some targets, you may have heard of them 10 years ago called the HE targets and pretty much every country in the world has failed to meet them. Um, uh, so what we're looking at this time is trying to make sure that, that we have a proper kind of implementation mechanism which requires countries to actually put those things into practice rather than just setting a load of targets and then in 10 years finding that we're in the same place. One of the big targets that, that is being kind of, is gaining a lot of traction is an idea of a 30, what's called the 30 by 30 target. So 30% of the, the world's land and sea area will be protected areas by 2030. That's the kind of really ambitious goal that they're aiming for as a kind of headline target for that, um, that convention. And we support that but it has to have the involvement of indigenous communities um, and local communities because um, otherwise, you know, drawing lines on maps and saying you can't go in there and, and use the, you know, firewood for your little home anymore or whatever it might be that the, that the local and indigenous communities are using that land for is just completely um, counterproductive. So it needs to have the sort of buy-in and involvement of indigenous and local communities in that protected areas target. And it also has to have really, really good implementation mechanisms. And we will need to see national action, not just a kind of agreement at international level. So those are some of the things that I would say are uh, kind of useful ways of trying to protect habitats in the face of uh, these sorts of pandemics. Stop sharing. Thanks, Anna. That was that was great. Um, yeah, and I particularly enjoy, enjoyed the mention of uh, of the Polish litigation, which I remember reading and thinking, "This is genius." Um, and yeah, no, it was really good to hear. Um, well, we'll come back to questions. I've got a couple of questions that we'll, we can come back to to later. Um, but but for now, we'll move on uh, to, to Yasser. Um, so Yasa is, is is a barrister at, at Landmark Chambers and 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 a leading leading barrister in Landmark Chambers, and he works across. Um, admin in public law, planning law, and, and property law, and and yes, it has over the years worked on worked on issues on, on a wide range of public law issues. So ranging from deportation to um, algorithms and de decision making, uh, but also on environmental issues such as airport expansion. Um, and, and and most more recently, he worked with the Good Law Project uh, on on our clean air case um, in, in the High Court, which sought to challenge the UK's clean air strategy, uh, which we said didn't go far enough in protecting the population from uh, the effects of air pollution uh, that can aggravate the impact of, uh, that was aggravated by, uh, that can aggravate COVID-19 effects as well. Um, and of course, we've, we've more recently read about the damning uh, reports in, in, in the context of the Elacacy Debra case. So um, hand over to you now, Yasser, uh, to talk us through that case. Thanks, Sahel. Thanks for um, introducing me. I was gonna say, I can't remember the last time I saw you in a shirt. I also um, <laughs> exactly I'm about, a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to share my screen, so hopefully you can see my slides. 
Yeah. Yeah. Princess. And yep. I would, and I, the follow up to that is I can't remember the last time I wore a full suit. So I'm not picking on you here, Sahil. Um, but <laughs> thanks to PIEL very much for inviting me along today um, and speaking on this topic, which is, you know, just so important. And it is a real pleasure to be here. What am I going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking about, as Sahil mentioned, the Good Law Project, which I was involved in, which dealt head on with the topic we are concerned about. And I should also say that it, you see the case title there, it was a good law project, they were the first claimants. We also had, we were also representing Mums for Lungs, Students for Global Health, and the UK Youth Climate Coalition, as well as two individuals who wanted to be involved. And important to that case, and to what environmental law can do to protect against future pandemics in general, is I think the precautionary principle. So as well as talking about the case, I will, at the end, talk briefly about the precautionary principle, which, to be fair, also formed a fundamental part of the case, but I'll talk about it briefly, separately, afterwards. I think I'll be talking for about 10 minutes, so you don't have to bear, bear with me for too long. So, as Chuck Sahel mentioned, we were challenging the clean air strategy. What is it? Well, you can see it's a, it's a very colourful document. Um, it was published in 29, you can see on the face of the document, and it important background that it was not produced, not produced out of a statutory obligation. So the government wasn't legally obliged to make the clean air strategy. Um, I think I mentioned it, the client earth, litigation, air quality was all involved with air quality targets, air quality limits that the government had to comply with. And those were EU obligations um, and therefore Involve different legal issues. Here you have the clean air strategy, which is not itself required by EU law or domestic law. But what it did do was it pulled together, pulled together things like air quality obligations, air quality targets, aspirations, and then set out the policy responses that were going to be undertaken to improve air quality. So it's bringing everything together and saying, we're going to do this by then. And really important, I think, really important is that it was predicated on a certain cost benefit analysis. So it was saying air quality is going to be really expensive, but poor air quality is going to be really expensive. So let's make sure we spend enough ahead of time to prevent those harms, those losses. Um, and you can see some of the wording there, talking about uh, that, that third paragraph, talking about <clears throat> you know, how expensive poor air quality could be. And then COVID struck in 2020. And what you see there is just a smattering of studies that emerged throughout the course of last year. Um, and they were preprints at that stage. You know, this is scientific studies that are not yet peer reviewed because there hasn't been enough time to peer review them, but um, they're called preprints. They're printed initially so that the people of the world can see what is being suggested, what's being shown. Um, and these studies tended to show a potential causal link, a causal link between poor air quality and increased COVID incidence and mortality. So it was saying the more, um, the worse the air quality is in your country, in a specific location, the more likely you are to get COVID. And once you have it, the more likely you are to die from it or suffer. Bad and these studies sprung up all over the world in relation to different populations, different um, universities, different methodologies being used, not just one or two, but literally dozens. And of course, none of them are perfect because it's impossible to hold randomized controlled trials of this kind of thing, just it's impossible. But some of them, many of them were very sophisticated in controlling for confounding variables. So one thing you could say, well, Poor air pollution happens in dense cities, and it's the dense cities that are causing the increased spread of, more, of COVID. So that's an obvious argument. You could say, well, it's nothing to do with air quality, it's to do with other things, um, correlation rather than causation. But as I said, many of these studies have very sophisticated methodologies, analyses, controlling for those kind of confounding variables. And we got uh, the Good, Good Law Project, and we got a professor at Harvard to write an expert report looking at studies and coming to a conclusion on a causal link between air quality and COVID incidence and mortality. Now, he didn't say there was definitely a causal link, and indeed no 
I imagine would ever say that. Like, no, you're not ever going to get a lawyer to give a straight answer. But what he did do is he talked about the strength of the connection and used wording that, at the very least, engaged, raised to the level of precautionary principles. So you've got a reasonable body of opinion which suggests one thing. So we asked the government to review its clean air strategy. We said that the cost benefit analysis was now completely out. The government was spending tens, if not hundreds of billions, trying to sort out a situation that had been exacerbated by poor air quality. So please review it with the hope that you decide to take more swift and more far reaching policy responses on air quality. And that will save people's lives in relation to COVID and it will save you money. And as I'm employed to be there, probably guessed by now what the government said. Um, that's probably an unfair categorization of their response. But anyway, I thought it was funny. Uh, but what they said was there were no compelling reasons to bring forward the review. No compelling reasons. I'm part of that, and I should say the review was going to happen a couple of years later anyway. And part of that was they said that the evidence wasn't yet robust enough. It wasn't proved that there was that link. So on the back of that, we issued a pre-action letter, got a response, which denied they were acting unlawfully, and then we issued the claim last year. What were our arguments? Two main arguments. One was that the Secretary of State had failed to apply the precautionary principle as a freestanding principle in domestic law, i.e. not as part of domestic EU law, because as I mentioned, there was no EU law element to this. And second, that there was a breach of Articles 2 and 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. I'm going to go into those just in a bit of detail. So normally, as I said, the precautionary principle would apply if it was EU law being implemented. And uh, the precautionary principle is a general principle of EU law, so it sneaks in that way. But the clean air strategy didn't arise out of an EU law obligation. So the question was, how else could we get the precautionary principle in? How else did it fight? Uh, and we say two ways. One, it was already recognised. And someone, I think maybe someone else has mentioned the Heathrow runway case. Um, that was a challenge to the decision to make Heathrow the preferred location of airport expansion in the government's national policy statement. And the Court of Appeal, in a landmark judgment and widely reported at the time, quashed that policy because it was unlawful for a number of reasons. And one was that the government failed to consider the effect of non-CO2 emissions. And the Court of Appeal said it was required to do so. And it wasn't entitled to dismiss those non-CO2 emissions dismiss those out of hand because there was a level of uncertainty about them as the precautionary principle required it to be considered. And those non-CO2 emissions um, the obligations in relation to that didn't arise out of EU law, so it couldn't be said that it was, um, it came into EU law, it came in as part of domestic law. So we said, that shows it's part of domestic law. Now I should say, not on my slide, I should say, the Supreme Court judgment came out a few months later than that and a few months ago and reversed Court of Appeal decision. Uh, but on, the, on that point, it was a bit more skeptical about the precautionary principle. So it may be that this argument would no longer be as good as it was then. But that's what we were saying. Uh, we were saying that the precautionary principle and the second bullet there had also now crystallized into customary international law. In other words, there was an extensive practice of states around the world abiding by it as a matter of law or other requirement. And let me tell you, it's not an easy not an easy task trying to prove that. You literally have to look at dozens of international treaties, declarations, domestic constitutions, just think of how many countries there are in the world, and their laws and their policies to see how many countries really abide by the principle and how. And thankfully, we had a trusty team of researchers at the Good Law Project. Um, and also quite an old book from about 2000 that dealt with this in some detail. So we were able to make a good fist of it. And the basic point was that the government's response, that it didn't want to review the clean air strategy and there was no compelling reasons for it doing so, breached the precautionary principle. And in circumstances where there was good evidence of a link between air quality and COVID, the government couldn't use lack of full scientific certainty as a reason for postponing measures. So that was the point. And then the Article 2 and Article 8, I'm sure you know Article 2 
protects the right to life. Article 8 protects the right to respect for private life. Uh, and the argument was quite straightforward. It was that Article 2 was engaged because of the threat to life caused by COVID. Therefore, state has a positive obligation to take steps to mitigate that threat, as long as it doesn't impose an impossible burden on you. And think of all the lockdown regulations that have been imposed by government, um, all the bad travel ban measures. Those have all been, um, I'm sure, justified by protecting right to life to Article 2. So this was a similar kind of piggybacking of that argument. And we would say the lack of concrete proof is not a good response because the convention incorporates a precautionary principle. And we relied on the case of Tata, and I, so I don't speak Romanian, so I don't know if that's how you pronounce the name, but uh, the case of Tata. And in that case, interesting case, the applicants lived in the vicinity of a gold mine and they complained that the use of sodium cyanide to extract the gold was putting their lives in danger. I think the, 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 one of the children had asthma and it was aggravating the asthma. And they said that the state didn't take any steps to protect their right to a healthy environment. And they relied specifically on the precautionary principle due to the lack of concrete proof between the use of the sodium cyanide and the asthma or the other the health suffered by the family and the children. And the government argued it was impossible to prove that causal link. But notwithstanding that, the European Court of Human Rights found a violation of Article 8 and said that in doing so, it referred in detail to the precautionary principle and how that bridged the gap between um, the lack of, well, bridged the gap between lack of science. So we had the court hearing in December, and unfortunately, our claim was refused. Um, and the judge found that even though the precautionary principle as a freestanding principle in domestic law may have been a good point, the government had in any event taken a precautionary approach in any event. And the government had argued that even though it said the precautionary principle didn't apply, in any event, it had undertaken that approach by continuing to look at the evidence, continuing to commission their scientists to look at the full evidence. And the court said that that was enough of that instance. So that's the case. Lots of things emerge from it. Um, and maybe we'll be cases in the future that kind of rely on some of the arguments being made there. But as far as it goes, that, that's where it ended and there was no appeal. So they're focusing on the precautionary principle. I think my takeaway from the case and from looking at the law in general is to emphasize how important I think the precautionary principle is going to be if environmental law is going to play a part in future pandemics. And now this stems from the perennial difficulty of proving causal link between environmental conditions and infectious disease. Because without that robust evidence, it makes it very easy for governments to wriggle out taking steps, like they did in our case, saying um, they will continue to review the emerging evidence. Um, but it's not at a point yet where it can get to that next evidence. Because what the precautionary principle does is it lowers the bar. So that even if we cannot yet prove causal link, there is reliable scientific data which, which expresses the reasonable possibility of harm occurring. Uh, so in principle, that's great, but how does it mirror onto the English legal system? And this is where we see the intersection between environment, COVID, um, or the public health, and Brexit. I know you've got another session on Brexit, and we've now left the EU. So the precautionary principle doesn't automatically bite now as an EU principle in the same way that it did before. So how else can it come in? Now, I think Anna mentioned the Environment Bill, which is taking a long time to make its way onto the statute books. But as it currently stands, it will include a weak semblance of the precautionary principle as compared to what we've previously known it as part of the EU. Basically, it'll be one of a number of principles that policymakers may have to consider when making policy. It will not help when challenging individual decision making, i.e., I permit this coal mine, um, or I permit X, Y, Z, um, or I permit fracking here and there, it won't help with those decisions. And even then, the obligation in terms of policy is to take it into account, not to abide by it. So, what, what else? What about EU retained law? Now, this may be getting a bit technical, but I think it's interesting. Um, now, as you may know, what do I mean by EU retained law? may know that in the EU Withdrawal Act 2018, we basically copied and pasted lots of EU law into domestic law 
so that there wouldn't be large gaps in our law the day after we left. And the idea was that the government could then, as it as and when it saw fit at the appropriate time, change the law. Um, the Withdrawal Act itself expressly says that general principles of EU law, notwithstanding the copy and paste thing, it expressly says that general principles of EU law, of which of course one, cannot be used as cause of action themselves. So EU retained law in and of itself doesn't transpose fully the precautionary principles. So how else are we going to get there? Well, um, there might be individual pieces of legislation, might be habitats legislation, for example, that does expressly rely on it, and some of the previous case law, which um, the European Court relied on, um, sorry, decided, will still be binding in the UK coming forward, but it's a bit difficult. There is another way, and that is the EU and UK deal that was struck at the last minute in 2020. And in that, it talks about each party committing to respect the precautionary principle. And maybe stretching the bounds of, of, of keeping up on what happened on that day, but also on that day, the government passed the Future Relationship Act, which basically sought to transpose or make effective the deal in domestic law. And Section 29 is a relevant provision which purports to give effect to the agreement within domestic law. So that might be another way in for the precautionary principle, um, i.e. the deal says precautionary principle has to be abided by and therefore obligations that the government, the things the government does, um, which are done because the law says it has to be you know, certain things in the environment, um, therefore the precautionary principle binds because of such a kind of act. But as I said, that is an argument that hasn't yet been run. We will live to see what it what will happen. Um, but it's possibly an argument too detail to go into detail right now, but it one to watch out for. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I think I actually ran over my 10 minutes, which is hazard of the job, I think. So sorry about that. But I think um, I'll hand over back to Sahil and then I think Monica next. Thank you very much. Thanks, Yasser. Um, that was a great, uh, great summary and, and, and um, a useful indication of the way forward. And I think we'll come back to that um, in the Q&A. Um, so moving on now to our, to our last speaker, um, who's Monica Ferrier Tinta, who's uh, a barrister at 20 Essex Chambers, who, uh, who specializes in, in public international law. Um, I don't need to explain her credentials, but but just by way of example, she was shortlisted for the Barrister of the Year by uh, the Lawyers Award, uh, the Lawyers Awards for 2020 for her work on groundbreaking litigation addressing climate change, and and she's acted on on a number of global cases on issues around environmental degradation, uh, climate change as human rights issue, uh, which I think is is a topic of particular interest, and the enforcement of the Paris Agreement. Um, and, and recently, uh, Monica uh, secured UN intervention on, on behalf of an indigenous uh, Colombian community uh, who suffered increased risk from COVID-19 uh, due to air pollution from, uh, from a nearby mine. Uh, so it's a very topical experience, and I'm uh, looking forward to hear, hear a bit more on that. Um, so over to you, Monica. Um, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Now, in the few minutes that I have available, I'd like to perhaps highlight some specific points. Um, so this is, a, this is a case study that follows a bit from the discussion uh, my colleagues have started. But I like to say, um, so this case arrived to me in the middle of COVID-19 last year. Um, my previous experience had been, uh, for example, acting in the Torres Strait case, which has been referred earlier. I um, uh, have been counseling the case and in, in fact um, I came up with the um, forum where to take this case to which was the UN. Um, now in, in, in approaching uh, for example that case my position was clearly that um, since the Paris Agreement was um, adopted um, although the Paris Agreement didn't have a um, mechanism to, this, to, to settle disputes. Um, nevertheless, 
it, in, it, is, it is relevant for the interpretation of a number of treaties, uh, which changes the panorama completely. And I argue that uh, those treaties include human rights treaties. Uh, and this is precisely what I did with the Torres Strait case, was to interpret the obligations of the states vis-a-vis -vis, uh, their populations. Um, and not just uh, people within their own jurisdictions, but it could potentially also be uh, people uh, in a diagonal way uh, that is beyond their own boundaries when it comes to transboundary pollution, um, based on a rights-based approach. And I think this is quite key. Um, so when I had this uh, particular, uh, and by, by that I mean a rights-based approach and not just um, a, a rights-based approach in which we are no longer anymore too concerned at the level of international law with, 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 with the specific causal links, but we rather look at the primary obligations of the states. So I wouldn't, if I had say like been working on the case that had been just uh, uh, presented by Jasir, I would have had probably a different approach. And so when we comes when it comes to these primary obligations, the, the the big question is to identify those and to identify the standards as to how uh, a state is charges those primary obligations, and 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 there are specific ways to do so. So in the case of um, this particular mine, um, there was an urgent need to, to take action. Um, the first uh, clip showed that there had been already um, a long, uh, if you want, uh, long, a long going dispute that had been, that had started uh, a decade ago. Um, the pit where, where we have seen it, the closest one to a, um, uh, indigenous people's uh, base, uh, it, it is, you know, extremely close and the effects have been devastating. In fact, the whole area of Wajira uh, has been um, very much affected by the mine. The whole area of La Wajira in Colombia has become a big, big, uh, 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 I would say, um, um, mining spot with people living within. And there is nothing more uh, capable to pollute the environment that open cast mining. Now, what was rather shocking for me was the connection with us. Uh, so this, in these cases of, um, of environmental um, um, harm, sometimes is not uh, something that is happening in one focalized part of the world that has no connection with the other side. Something that I'd like you to take away with you um, after this conference is how interconnected environmental issues are uh, globally. So what, what was shocking for me was to see that this um, environmental devastation happening in La Guajira had a deep connection with our development here in Europe, because that was powering um, mostly uh, European electricity in, in major jurisdictions, such as uh, we, we just saw some examples then, Netherlands, I mean, Germany. I mean, Germany doesn't have any more coal mining, but you know, it's, it's, it, in a way you are, you, are, you are exporting somehow your environmental harm because although you used coal, you buy that for powering uh, and having electricity in your jurisdiction, the harm is happening somewhere else. Not, not in Europe. And that was quite shocking. And the other element was, of course, that um, the owners of this uh, huge uh, mine uh, are um, European companies, you know, BHP, well, BHP is Australian, Anglo-American is the UK, UK um, based, um, and then Glencore, which is Swiss. So the, the reason why I highlight this is because it's extremely important to see how connected these, all these elements are. And I had that approach in developing really, you know, what strategy um, I was to, to, to follow. So the first one was this right, right space approach. Now, because it was urgent, I decided to go to a mechanism that could provide some kind of, um, if not remedy, um, intervention uh, at the first state, uh, step in, on an urgent basis. And, uh, I brought the case before the um, special procedures of the UN. Um, I prepared the whole case within a week, really, and it was quite intense. Um, 
and also quite painful because the um, you know this was a this is a very vulnerable community, uh, which shows and represents also the level of discrimination. You know that we I mean someone was pointing out that at the beginning of this conference um, the issues of uh, the vulnerability of certain groups of certain um, sectors globally when it comes to who is the most affected. Uh, and, and, and that it comes to COVID, but also is, is relevant for climate change. Uh, I mean, the communities in the Pacific that are suffering in these islands, in Torres Strait, where their islands are sinking. I mean, they are the ones that have contributed the least to all this mess, and yet they are the ones that are affected the most. And I could think of many examples, but certainly these indigenous communities in the middle of uh, Colombia um, are being affected by our um, you know, so-called development. I mean, this 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 industrialization that has taken us uh, to a point where uh, you know the environment is breaking down. Um, so the the other um, the other consideration, apart from this interconnectedness, was uh, the fact that um, Colombia, uh, as many other jurisdictions in Latin America, are monist states. That means that they um, have obviously ratified a number of treaties uh, that are relevant to, for example, apply to a situation like the one I had to deal with, um, but that they not they do not need um, um, implementation of those treaties in the domestic jurisdiction in the manner a dualist system does. For example, the UK that has to enable. Um, um, legislation to be able, for example, to apply an international treaty that is signed and ratifies. So that uh, provided uh, a very powerful ways for me to actually use international treaties to analyze the situation uh, of these YU people affected by uh, the uh, pollution uh, in, 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 in El Sarajón example. Um, and further, um, so well, okay, I brought the case. Um, uh, using all these different elements, uh, including the regional treaties that are relevant there. Now, the right to life has been um, mentioned before, and, and here it was extremely relevant. In particular, there has been already advances, such as the advisory opinion from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, that has acknowledged that the right to life uh, includes the right to a healthy environment, something that um, can be applied constitutionally directly in all these uh, jurisdictions in, in Latin America. And, and a principle that definitely I have used in my practice to argue cases that go well beyond the Americas, um, but that have helped to develop uh, principles also within the European system and within the UN system, which has already been uh, embraced. Now, I happen to be successful with my uh, advocacy in this case, and the UN uh, intervened in September uh, last year. And I, I want to read a couple of sections there uh, because I think it's, they're very enlightening. Um, and the Special Rapporteur on Environment and Human Rights, uh, supported by another, I believe, about eight rapporteurships, including, including also Working Group on Business and Human Rights, uh, stated, Breathing polluted air and not having enough clean water puts people at greater risk of becoming sick. Well, in this particular case, the mine used practically uh, all sources of water because it needs about 20, over 24 uh, million liters of, of water per day. So um, the rivers and, and everything have been either polluted or, or been um, completely used by, by the needs of the, of the mining uh, in, 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 in Sarajón. So, and so the people only have access to water via deliveries. So basically they live in a desertic place, highly polluted and with uh, no access to, to, to water. Um, okay, Boy added that during the coronavirus pandemic, uh, this can be a deadly threat. The science, the science is very clear. People living in areas that have experienced higher levels of air pollution, such as that around the Cerrejon mine, face increased risk of premature, premature death from COVID-19. Uh, mining and transportation along railroads, also owned by the company, emit fine particles called PM2.5, invisible to the human eye. The pollute, this pollutant can cause asthma, 
respiratory illness, heart disease, hypertension, and cancer, skin and eye damage, miscarriages, and premature births, but only began to be measured in 2018 after the mine had already begun operating for 35 years. The Cerejon mine is also the largest water polluter in the region. The company not only diverts and uses a huge number of streams and uh, tributaries, but also pulls back water contaminated with heavy metals and chemicals. In response to this, the company um, has helped to track water to residents, but Boyd said that the water pollution had denied the communities of access to clean water in the first place. This has made the YU community more dependent on the alternative source of water and leaves them more exposed to the risk of COVID-19. Um, so finally, um, said, uh, it is absolutely vital that Colombians protect the indigenous people's right to life health, right to water, right to sanitation, and right to a safe, safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment by halting mining close to the provincial reserve until it can be safe. So um, as you see, this is all right-based. Um, um, I would have not uh, just you, uh, rely on the precautionary principle for this. Another issue that I used, uh, which was uh, strategic, in fact, was obviously it would have been very difficult for uh, the UN special procedures to state facts, uh, uh, you know, uh, alone, because this was a very complex case. So the, the amount of evidence was massive. Um, and it, it's unlikely that uh, an organ of this sort is going to be, is going to do a fact finding um, exercise, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis such a complexity of evidence. So what I did was rather to utilize the, the uh, findings of the Colombian courts themselves, uh, you know, that, that had been already dealing with a number of cases and then e elevating all of these, analyzing all of it and translating all of that in the language of international law so that the uh, rapporteurships could rely on these facts. But, but apply international law to ascertain what uh, the uh, duties of Colombia uh, were. The good thing about the mechanism I used also was that um, not only uh, the UN engaged with Colombia as a state and its responsibilities, but also with the company, with the private sector. Um, and, and the September intervention asking to halt the uh, works in the closest bit to the community was unprecedented. It had never happened, um, so it was quite a quite a welcome step uh, above all for the communities that for the first time had uh, their 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 predicament being heard somewhere internationally. And now um, I have um, further been instructed to um, bring um, the claim uh, before um, other procedures, which are um, now. Uh, looking into this with a view to close the, uh, to the mine. So um, I leave that there. I think uh, there may be uh, quite a lot of questions that can be posed around uh, this, but, but I think that it is quite crucial to um, understand how um, different courses of action can take place if one understands uh, how uh, interconnected different jurisdictions are and also how domestic uh, um, jurisdictions interconnect with international law and international uh, fora. Um, and perhaps also uh, to use um, treaties that are, uh, and perhaps, for example, the Paris Agreement being one of those, uh, that have um, shed a new light into the obligations of states uh, um, under different other treaties. Thank you very much. That was great, Monica. Thank you so much. Um, really inspiring um, stuff. And, and and as you said, the the pictures really really spoke. Uh, you know, spoke to us because it's clearly clearly an issue. And you know, it, as you as you said, it it's often the global impacts are a, are a fallout of decisions taken by private sector actors and, and governments in in a small number of countries that have have such wider global impacts. And, and we'll we'll come back to that. Um, We've had we've had a, a number of really interesting questions uh, come in, um, so uh, perhaps the best thing to do might be for for me to start uh, 
putting some of those questions to the to our speakers um and then uh we'll welcome, welcome thoughts i, I might I'm going to post, push the question to one of you, but uh, the other should very much feel free to jump in. Um, although the first one perhaps is one specifically for Chris, uh, which is, and, and I think it's a very interesting question actually. Um, what is the state of funding for research into the connection between environmental disruption and pandemics? Um, and the second bit, which I think is interesting is, do you think funding opportunities have been affected by the fact that often these emerging diseases manifest in more and see it more seriously affect marginalized communities. Is, is that something you've seen? Um, yeah, forgive me, I've had a bit of an unstable connection, so I've, so I've missed, missed and I think I understand it. Um, so the, yeah, so if it's about funding of research into that initial spillover phase of a pandemic, then Yes, I think there's definitely been a response, um, you know, related to COVID. There has been a number of very large funding efforts to try to work out the ecology of spillover. The most notable one is one that I used to work on in when I was based in the US. Um, it was a USAID funded program uh, into what they call emerging pandemic threats. And it was a really, really big five armed kind of program of which I worked on one of them, which was called PREDICT. There were four other arms that sort of formed the overall space of this idea of trying to predict the next pandemic. And we're talking in the order of about, well, for just for PREDICT, the one that I worked on, it was 200 million over 10 years. Um, and for the bigger program, I guess it was around about a billion over 10 years, something like that. So it's quite a lot of money um, for research, I would say. A lot of that money that we were working on in PREDICT was, was around capacity building in areas where we thought that the risk of emergence was likely to be higher than elsewhere. Um, and that tended to be sort of revolver, revolving around this idea that you have high biodiversity in contact with changing landscapes and growing populations and things. So that took, took us very much to the sort of developing tropics. Um, where we were sort of working with, with country partners to build labs and diagnostic capacity, but also then go and sample wildlife for, um, you know, try to discover, discover pathogens and work out whether there was a, some risk of newly discovered pathogens spilling over into the human population. So in response to, to that kind of effort, you know, there's been quite a, a lot of information about these sort of ingredients that are required for this process to occur. Um, that program was ended kind of ironically in the same year that, that um, COVID emerged, but there's been a few efforts to kind of um, bring in additional and growing funding to that, to that stage. Um, I think one of the interesting things is that, and, and lots of people have talked about this, is that this is just one tiny component of spillover leading to pandemics. Of course, the impacts of pandemics are determined by how far it spreads and how, and what you know what effects it has on the population, whether it can be contained, whether it can be managed, whether sick people can be um, you know treated, and the development of vaccines and all that kind of stuff. So COVID has been like an amazing global experiment of how to deal with an unexpected um, pandemic. So now we have a lot more information about how much it costs to do all these things, where we should be directing our efforts, and all that kind of th thing. And so I fully expect those. Um, insights and the learning that we've had to inform the funding landscape to improve pandemic response. Um, but because that's so multifaceted, I really don't know where that, that um, you know, money is going to be concentrated to or whether there is going to be some kind of um, allocation effort based on these different, you know, areas of, of lack of knowledge, you know, for example, that could be hindering us in this situation. Um, with respect to the community component of that question about vulnerable communities and things like that. I mean, I think, yeah, this is, this is always a very, um, you know, I guess it, it, it's a very topical kind of area because you have this sort of, this conflict between what people, you know, in, you know, for example, indigenous communities using their environment in a way that's um, supporting their livelihoods, often historically in a sustainable way more recently perhaps uh, increasingly less sustainable with the advent of new technologies and things in, that, that can facilitate um, you know people to sort of increasingly exploit the natural resources around them um, 
I think it's a case by case sort of a basis. I think there's no really strong way that we can yet spatially prioritize particular communities or particular groups with respect to the risk of you know emerging or spillover emerging diseases or spillover in particular so i think it's it's again i'm you know getting back to that very complex ecology of spillover in the beginning prevents us from doing a lot of the things that that um you know that we would sort of advocate on the basis of a precautionary principle we don't have the sort of nitty-gritty to in the scientific detail to go in and really you know have the the quantitative details to make those sorts of decisions at this point i hope that goes some way in answering your that you know this question which is which is a very large one thank you chris um very helpful um perhaps if i um start off maybe with with, with some of the sort of narrower focus questions maybe dealing with domestic policy and then sort of move out to some of the bigger ticket questions um and so maybe the first one if i can uh put it to yes sir about we uh, it's about how courts are responding uh to climate change and pandemic related arguments and and maybe if yes sir, but i think monica and anna may have something to say about this as well because uh, certainly from where i'm i'm sitting um the english court sometimes seem to be uh trapped rightly or wrongly in, in a bit of orthodoxy when it comes to thinking about uh, climate change and government obligations. But what, what are you finding? I'm, I was on, I'm just unmuting myself. Yeah. yeah, I think that's probably right. I mean, the other place that these kind of challenges will go is the High Court. So yeah, the High Court court will be the Supreme Court. They wouldn't really go to other tribunals or other county courts or something. They'd go to those appellate courts. Um, pandemic cases, there's been lots of COVID cases, non-environmental COVID cases. And the government has been very cautious about overturning the government's response. There's very, very few cases where claimant has won challenging some kind of COVID regulation or that kind of thing. Equally, there's very few domestic cases where <clears throat> climate, very few domestic, few domestic climate cases that have won. Um, you have the climate earth air quality cases that were very successful, but kind of notable by the fact that they succeeded when many, many other environmental cases have not succeeded. You had the Heathrow expansion case that won in the Court of Appeal, but lost in the Supreme Court. Um, so again, they've been quite cautious on climate cases. Good Law Project had a case which government conceded with the Energy and National Policy Statement. Government agreed to review that. So that was a win of sorts as well, but that wasn't the court kind of taking a view. So I think, yeah, they were quite cautious. And the reason why I've dealt with those individually is because there simply hasn't been that much litigation on COVID's effect uh, on the environment and COVID. The Good Law Project, when I mentioned it, which I was involved in, which you were involved in, Sahil, is one of the few that have related. I mean, the UK's court's approach can be contrasted with, for example, the Netherlands. We have the famous Agenda case, which was decided last year, which decided that the Netherlands weren't going far enough in their... Um, climate change obligations they weren't doing enough and that therefore there was a breach of article 2 of the European Convention on right to life so you do have these cases emerging in other countries in England and Wales at the moment hasn't been that much but I'm sure there will be more as time goes on Sorry, um, Monica were you gonna were you gonna jump in yes um, well I mean it's interesting uh, when Forest Strait case was the first international case that was taken up. Um, and I remember that at the time, uh, um, various NGOs were extremely worried that if a, a case like that were to reach international courts, maybe courts were not ready to take up such a, such a challenge, which I thought it was rubbish, really. It was the high time, it was the right moment. Actually, we were running out of time. Um, now, uh, the reason why I mentioned international courts is because of the following. Um, so at the time, for example, you know, the agenda um, success um, made us many uh, believe that perhaps um, domestic courts uh, were um, going to be dealing with uh, these type of cases in the same manner the Netherlands did. And so they were rather more interested in focusing on that. And, and when there are remedies, I think it is, it is important that that is done yeah, in every single uh, uh, avenue you can uh, reach. But I think the advantage of now uh, having these ongoing cases before uh, international courts, and that includes before the European Court of Human Rights, which we know now we, it has about three cases, 
pending, uh, some of them uh, extremely ambitious, um, facing different hurdles, but uh, right now uh, waiting to be adjudicated. Um, and the case, for example, of Torres Strait before uh, the UN, the advantage is that uh, once those cases are um, adjudicated and there is a decision on that, it's going to be extremely influential on all those domestic systems. So, you know, if the Supreme Court got it wrong on something, or if, if the High Court got, it, got the, the law wrong, then these international cases are going to clarify the obligations of uh, states uh, you know, the cases before the European Court for, for all the uh, countries that are party to the European Convention of Human Rights. And in the case, say, like of the uh, UN system, uh, for all those states that have uh, signed up and ratified the International Cabinet on Civil and Political Rights, which is a global treaty, and it's going to be a massive effect. Now, for example, we are going to have that judgment this year. So the Torres Strait is the first judgment that we are going to have possibly, you know, in the next months. And the, the implications of that is going to be that we are going probably to see a major ripple effect on, on, on in the next months, you know, on what happens actually in all these different jurisdictions. So in other words, uh, don't, uh, when it comes to strategic litigation, one doesn't go to the lowest courts, uh, you know, to think where to make major changes. It's going to be, you know, the ones that have a, a decisions that are more influential. Thank you. And I, I think I was going to come to Anna in this actually, because I, I was I'd be quite interested in hearing um, what client earth experiences have been in, in sort of different jurisdictions and, and whether that sort of tactical element uh, sort of plays a big part in, in picking what, what cases you're going to take forward. Yeah, so I, I think it's worth it's worth sort of noting that it's very rare for one case to completely change the way that that kind of laws work or the way that that, that courts perceive something. These these are kind of little incremental steps often, and you know each case has its its part in in making those changes. And it's fair to say that although that clean air litigation has been successful and it's been successful across Europe, that's a kind of ten year project. You know, we were unsuccessful many times <laughs> in that UK case. We lost at every level until we got to the, the Court of Justice. So, um, you know, these these things do take time and sometimes courts have to sort of learn from from other cases above. Um, the way that we try to bring litigation is, is we do try to look at it sort of strategically across a jurisdiction or across um, a region and say, well, how can we bring different cases that will help not only to sort of make a, a precedent or a, a kind of a, a good decision in a particular court, but, but that will have a sort of a bigger impact in terms of changing the way that um, perhaps the issue is perceived, raising the profile of an issue. So that, that air quality, those air quality cases are a perfect example. You know, if you'd asked us 10 years ago, were we going to get a decision um, that said no cars should be allowed, no diesel cars should be allowed in the centre of Munich, we would have said that's absolutely out of the question. But but we now have that decision. And in fact, the Court of Justice said, you know, that the, the courts in Germany have to give us a remedy, which is actually um uh you know actionable up to and including putting the mayor of munich in prison if he refuses to do it so um you know we <laughs> that's not your starting point but it's where it's where you get to when you do these kind of incremental cases um and i will say client earth had a case um uh, where we challenged the, the gas fire power station drax a big coal fire power station that wants to convert some of its um its uh, turbines to gas. Um, we challenged the planning decision there. We lost that case at the Court of Appeal, but the court did say in its judgment, actually, um, the government can take into account climate change issues when it's making these planning decisions. It's not beyond the realms of the sort of, you know, planning policy for it to take into account the impacts of climate change. And in fact, Drax have now scrapped the plan, having having <laughs> having lost the case, they've, um, they have now uh, scrap, scrap the plan to, to do that conversion. Brilliant. Yeah, I think it's interesting what you say about incremental change through these cases. I think it's, it's easy to, to judge um, strategic litigation by, by sort of the victory, the success and failure of a single case when, uh, when it's a much longer process. Um, if, I, if I can stick to the sort of mac micro 
uh, which I stick to the UK and the EU for now. Um, from your from your perspective, and and I know Yasser touched on it uh, briefly in his presentation. What 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 do you think the UK can do better? Um, going back to your presentation in the environmental bill, and what would you like to see uh, the most of? Yeah, Anna, if I could come to you on that one. Yeah, so um, I'm going to confess that I am not our expert on UK uh, environment bill stuff. So I have colleagues who are doing huge amounts of work on that. And I know it's a massive, massive project. Um, I've only been involved on the sort of biodiversity side. And from that point of view, what we're looking for is a kind of commitment on the face of the bill that by 2030, the government will um, take measures to restore nature. Um, we, we know that there are going to be some commitments that the government will, will sign up to in Kunming when we have this, this COP when we have to finally get to the COP um, and, and ideally you would have those commitments and then translate them into the into UK law in that bill. We suspect the bill's probably going to go through Parliament before we get the final outcome of the COP so what we want to do is have a commitment in there that, that they will kind of restore nature and hopefully whatever the, the targets are that are agreed in the COP can sort of fall within that. Okay. Um, yes, uh, did you, was there anything that I know you touched on um, on the bill, but also uh, the, the post Brexit deal. Um, is there anything you'd like to see see more of? Because I, and it's going back to what Anna said about it would be nice to see a race to the top as opposed to a race to the bottom. Um, but it but it never seems to be the way, does it? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's a political question, isn't it? And that's yeah. not my expertise. But I think the sign. I mean, just I'm sure everyone else has read what I've read. The signs are that. Um, this government is quite keen to do more on the environment and is one of the things that kind of shares with the Joe Biden administration potentially. So um, I don't know, Anna's, Anna's, Anna's smirking, so <laughs> maybe that's not correct, maybe I'm completely wrong, but the um, environment bill has its flaws, doesn't it? And you'll hear more about that tomorrow, I think. Later yeah, on. There was an interesting uh, um, contrast last week, there was, a, there was an end uh, kind of update came around and the top story was about how the new regulator so there will be this new kind of body in the UK that will effectively kind of police the implementation of environmental legislation in the way that the European Commission would have done with infringement proceedings in the past the top story was about how this new regulator was going to be much more efficient and much better than the, the EU had ever been and then the story right underneath it was about how the environment agencies announced that it's not going to do any strategic environmental assessments of the river basin management plans because it doesn't think there's any impact on the environment from them and so you know I think I think what the government might say on one side and what it might do on the other side may be very different things and um, yeah I think we'll have to keep a close eye on it on how it's actually panning out in the UK. Yeah definitely. Um, a, qu a question for, for Monica and I think there's clearly lots of interest in, in, in your uh, Colombian case which, which is really powerful stuff as I said. Um, so I guess more, a practical question about how you heard about um, the case in the first place to take it on. Yeah, I mean, barristers were instructed from cases. I didn't hear from the case. I was okay. I, I was uh, contacted uh, by um, the uh, local, actually, local lawyers that have been trying to, for many, many uh, years, to get results without success. And because of my specialism uh, in public international law, I was instructed to advise on the case and to, to, to act on the case. Sure. Um, and uh, just a bit more on the sort of Leading, leading on from that, I think uh, I mean, I'm quite interested in, in sort of what, what communities can do. And this is a sort of question we've been uh, grappling with even at, at the Good Law Project about how we can empower small communities uh, a, to, to a, recognize the issue, think about it in legal terms, for example, and then find legal representation. Is, have you got any thoughts on, on, on how small communities can, uh, can think about these issues and find and access legal representation? Well, I don't think that nowadays, um, 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 you know, indigenous communities, local communities are isolated. I, I believe that, to be honest, um, we lawyers are not the, the leaders on this. Come on. You yeah, know, I think that's fair, very true. For, for many long, they're very well informed, they're very resilient. And I think that what, what, 
and also um, uh, local lawyers, you know, uh, to acknowledge the uh, hard labor that local lawyers have uh, put into these communities and how close they have worked with these local communities uh, to start with. I mean, as a barrister based in the UK, what I have, it's obviously very niche knowledge about how um, certain mechanisms work around the world, and particularly in public international law across. And, and, and sometimes, you know, I, I may see connections that local communities and their local lawyers may have not seen. And this is why, where, you know, minds come together and actually look for, for, for remedies. And I think as a practitioner, um, that's where my focus is. I mean, I am interested um, in, 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 in giving a remedy, in finding a remedy for the particular each problem or issue that the claimants, that my clients, um, have and and it is not a theoretical problem um, and although of course there is a um, perspective from the NGO uh, point of view as to incremental change etc etc but when it comes to representation of individuals and their own specific problems they want specific results in their uh, specific pro um, situation and I think that's where the responsibility um, comes you know as to finding the right type of uh, action for the right type of case. Yeah, I think I think that's um, that's that's really fair and sensible. Um, I'm going to take a look to see what other questions we've got out there because um, we've been flooded with questions. Um, um, this is um, a, a question I, I I don't fully understand. But Anna, I'm hoping you're going to be able to make a bit more sense of it around uh, whether you think major legal advances to protect biodiversity loss can only happen when you have a more sophisticated way of understanding their economic impact. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I understand it completely either, <laughs> to be honest. But um, I, I mean, I think I think there are sort of various different ways of tackling biodiversity loss and and um i think there has been a push in some places over the last few years to try to put a price on biodiversity and to say oh well you know the best way we can protect it is by saying oh look when you're making your calculations about you know um that cost and benefit the the bees are worth 20 million dollars and the you know the river is worth 30 million dollars I actually think that's quite risky um, because when we start to put numbers against them, we also start to kind of balance them in a sheet against other interests and and the environment, it, it has value for itself that you can't put a price on. Um, uh, so I, I'm a little bit cautious about that as an approach. I think, um, you know, in certain circumstances, it can be a useful tool to, to demonstrate that that you know there are some really really valuable kind of what we call ecosystem services so so sort of you know having trees on the hillside stops flooding from happening and therefore avoids you having a you know a, a cost of 70 billion dollars when there's a massive rainstorm um i think that can be that can be useful but i'm just a little bit cautious about too much of that kind of putting value on nature i hope that answers the question I no i think i think that's sensible because um obviously in the uk we had uh, recently had is it the das gupta review hmm. um which did sort of try and and put an economic price almost measure biodiversity as, as, as gdp was it um which, which I know had a positive reaction, but also uh, a level of skepticism in in that it sort of really narrows the field of how we understand how we understand nature and probably takes away from some of its essential characteristics. Um, but no, I think it's an yeah, it's an it's an interesting way of thinking thinking about it because in some ways it seems to me to make it in some ways makes it slightly more accessible yeah. because I think people are able to understand uh, these issues uh, easier if you put an economic value, but but uh, yeah, I think I'm. I'm on the same page that it's not uh, not an easy solution. Um, can, I, can I add something to that? that? Yes. yes, of course, Monica. Yeah. Um, you know, last last year I was involved in a case which which um, in a way uh, uh, brought that specific point to light. Um, this is a, a case concerning Ecuador, um, and uh, it was um, it is a, it's still ongoing. It, 
judgment is going to be uh, coming soon. Uh, and it's a case that actually was based on Article 71 of the Constitution of Ecuador, which protects, gives rights to nature um, as such. Um, and why was the case eventually all turned on Article 71 of the Equatorial Constitution? Because there was a patch of cloud forest that um, was going to be affected by mining, uh, gold mining. And uh, various species there are, you cannot find them anywhere else in the world because of the proximity to the equator line. So uh, loss of biodiversity, you know, being a crucial, crucial aspect. And why uh, the difference between this case and others uh, in Latin America is that actually there were no indigenous peoples living in this, in this forest. And therefore you couldn't argue, you know, that uh, uh, right to consent, you know, and all the things that we have heard in the morning from the, from the key uh, note speaker. We, we, we only had nature. And, and you know, and then the, the uh, Equatorian government, uh, central government, gave that, cons gave that on concessions to companies for, for a start in exploration of mining, because there was nobody to consult to. Um, and then the, the, the key question during the hearing, I, I was, um, I submitted an amicus curia and I was acting as an amicus at the hearing. It was very interesting because it was all about yeah, the companies saying about how much the investment could signify in terms of jobs for the community, etc, 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 and given a monetary value to that. And then, you know, you had uh, on the other side, uh, you know, should we be given some monetary value to uh, pristine forests? Actually, this was a primary forest, which means that it's an untouched forest. And I mean, we just heard uh, uh, from the first speaker in this panel how, how uh, important it, it, it is these resources when it comes to DNA, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that you find in this untouched forest that is still exists, probably very few in Europe, but mostly abroad. Um, and we have heard from Anna, you know, how these uh, huge forests actually can capture um, uh, carbons. And so this sequestration of carbons, etc. So, in fact, uh, destroying, let's say, that, that that particular forest in Ecuador, far away from England, would have an impact on climate and on England and Europe and everywhere else. So in a way, you know, it was interesting because even from the point of view, so I agree with Anna. This is far, far, goes far beyond anything monetary. I mean, who has, and I would say, talk, let's concentrate actually on primary type of rules. If we are talking about the Convention of Biodiversity, we are talking about the Convention of, on, on Heritage. And, and, and this is it. I mean, you may potentially wipe out um, a, a species, flora, fauna, and, 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 and parts of the world that the young generation will never actually get to know. And, and there is this element of, um, of collect, if you want the collectively, you know, the sectors of humanity that will be affected forever with a decision like that, let's say, let's wipe out that. It's, it's extremely interesting because it's, it goes into intergenerational, it goes into a number of uh, in very interesting notions and concepts and, and it's the very idea that, um, and this is something I think I, I like to, to throw out there for reflection. Um, we are so focused on anthropocentric perspectives and, mm. and what gives anyone the right to extinguish, to disappear, to, to, to wipe out species like the ones, for example, uh, that exist in Los Cedros in this case, uh, that went to, from the Paddington bear, which is the uh, um, spectacle bear, um, to others, you know, to disappear for good from Earth. And I'd say there isn't. So, you know, we have so many conventions that actually give rights to nature and give rights to, to, to species, etc., etc. And so I think that we should actually um, assert these primary obligations on, on themselves because they do exist um, domestically and I think internationally and, and shouldn't really play the game of, um, you know, seeing things in terms of um, a wrong vision, I think, of development and of, of progress. So I will invite the uh, audience and particularly the young audience here to um, rethink 
our notion of development and our notion of progress. Certainly, it's not about um, you know going uh, in the direction that we've been going because we can see the crisis in which we are right now. Thanks, Monica. Um, I think we could maybe squeeze just a just a couple more in um, as we're approaching a quarter past one. Um, and the first one is actually uh, for me to sort of build on what you said, Monica. Did you have any? Uh, did you have any thoughts on on, on sort of the recent rise and recent movement for um, giving human sort of effectively extending rights to nature. So you sort of talk about um, rights of rivers, for example, which we've seen examples of uh, of in India, for example, and and, and other parts of the world. Um, do, do you think that 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 is a it's an achievable goal, a positive positive goal? Yeah, sorry, Marco. Sorry, Monica, you're on mute, I think. Sorry. I think it's fundamental. Yeah. I think the change of par paradigm. I wrote a piece about how for a, for a long time, you know, when we talk about the right to life, the right to life as we conceive that today, you see, we've been talking about human rights treaties. It's all about the right to life of human beings. But, but we are only now understanding how inextricable is the right to life of human beings to you know, the environment itself and the preservation of the environment. So now, now there is this acknowledgement of this important link. So in the past, environmental law was running in parallel to human rights. Um, you know, we, we, we have heard uh, some principles, et cetera, et cetera. They were all running alongside, mostly in soft law. And only now we have uh, seen uh, the incorporation of these principles into more tangible, um, enforceable uh, rights but always via, you know, other mechanisms. And what we are seeing, uh, I think is the, not new, uh, certainly not a new wave, but rather a, a going back to ancient notions, you know, prior to all these generations of treaties that only focus on, on human rights. Um, and uh, the constitution of Ecuador or the constitution of Bolivia, and what, it, what we have seen in Colombia and, and in New Zealand, etc., is really going back to indigenous people's original visions of the world, where what you do is you protect the living and not just the right to life of individuals. And so, and so at the end, you obviously preserve the right to life of individuals by um, uh, accepting that all the living has rights. But I would say, most importantly, it goes beyond the, para the paradigm that we have had so far. And actually, you know, we accept that it's not any longer the anthropocentric perspective that actually is going to be um, the next, you know, in the next decades, you know, it's going to be the one that will preserve uh, the world in, in, in the manner that we hope that it will. Um, and I think that that's a big challenge for this um, generation, for us all. Um, but it's a wonderful challenge. I think it is, it is, it is moving uh, to see that uh, there is an urgency um, in terms of action and that uh, young people are very much invested on this as, as, as much as those who, you know, we want to contribute to that. Thanks, Monica. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's the essential thing. Right? These, these lessons are, are going to be carried forward by, by generations. And, and I think that, that sort of change in, change in mindset um, is, 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 is important academically, it's important for us as lawyers, and it's important to find ways of translating that shift in thinking to, to the courts where, where, where a lot of us spend uh, so much of our time. Um, um, with that, I think we have just come to the end, 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 end of the session. Um, maybe I might squeeze in one question for Chris, only because he's been left out of the conversation for the last 10 minutes. But and I think it's a good one, uh, which is, do you think the scientific community uh, can do more to improve its communication uh, and storytelling on, on, on these issues? And I, and I guess it goes back to what uh, Anna and I will talk about, about uh, how we measure biodiversity, for example. Um, is there better ways in which uh, the science can, can be framed to help inform policymakers and, and, and us lawyers who, do, who don't really understand the science often? No, I mean, I think, I think this demonstrates, you know, coverage of the key issues, you know, and I was just sort of reflecting on the ecosystem services paradigm and this idea of monetizing or quantifying the economic value of nature as a, it's actually a scientific process to try to bridge the gap 
between science and decision makers and policy makers. That's the whole point of the ecosystem services field of ecology and environmental sciences. I, it, it's almost in my mind as a sort of a, you know, a purist, you know, conservation biology background, ecologist, all the rest of it. We mentioned the intrinsic value of nature. That's fine. There are laws to protect species, for example, the Endangered Species Act, where I'm from. Um, but I think the stats are pretty clear that whatever we've done over the last 50 years is not working. And part of the reaction of the scientific community is to try to package up the science in a way where it can have more impact. And I think that's really, that really underlies the influence of the ecosystem services paradigm to, to, you know, to, to deliver this information to politicians and decision makers and, and whatnot, to make it more actionable, to make, to make that link clearer to what is really driving policy and decision making at the highest level. The UK is an interesting case. There's the Natural Capital Committee, which is sitting and advising on um, the value of nature for the environment, you know, the long term, the 25 year environment plan. That's an unbelievable, you know, thing to see for the UK. It doesn't exist in most other other places in, in, in that way. I don't know how effective it is or how effective it's going to be. It does gut the review, covers a lot of that sort of stuff. And again, it's just, I think that whole area is about bridging this this gap. Of course, there's more scientists can do. Scientists are generally, um, you know, well, I can't, I can't generalize, but often reluctant to, to engage in advocacy because there's a certain sentiment that that might under sort of undermine scientific independence. I think we're seeing with climate change and environmental degradation in general, that there are plenty of scientists that have crossed that line time and time and again. So there are many, many scientists around the world that have, um, you know, raised their voices over the past decades. And, and I think that's only increasing. And I think that's really needed. Um, yeah, not much more to say about that. I think of, often you do see this, this sort of this reaction that, well, scientists really need to step up and be heard. I mean, I don't think there's any shortage of information out there um, that scientists are delivering. It's about accessing it. It's about getting it, getting it into the public, you know, for public consumption and politic, po po political consumption. So um yeah complex area but yeah <laughs> Thanks, progress yeah there, very much very much didn't 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 intend to uh, blame the scientific community but i do think yeah, i do think it's quite fascinating uh to see you know what what appears to me to be quite clear science and and how it finds its way into into sort of lawmaking and and bridging that gap i think is going to be essential and 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 as communities uh and people around the world start uh, their eyes get more open to these situations that's what's going to drive drive change and, and drive support for you know the kind of cases that the good law project gets uh, brings or client earth brings or and monica and yes yes stand up in court and argue right um so i think yeah that's a brilliant way to to sort of round off uh, today's discussion uh, i've been to far too many um environmental law um seminars where all all that's discussed is is uh, a, like a case and, and what follows on from that one case but I think this has been a, a really diverse range of opinions and, and I'm really grateful to uh, PIE for organizing uh, organizing the session and, and to all four uh, speakers for their really fascinating insights uh, more of this more of this please um, thanks very much all